Am I the asshole for telling my husband I'll dispose of my feminine products when he wipes better? I'm a housewife, my husband works a nine to five, so I take care of the house all day, laundry, dishes, kids, etc. I just had a baby, so I'm still bleeding and I can't wear tampons. I can't wear tampons anyway because I have a tilted cervix, so I wear pads. When I change my pad, I wrap it in toilet paper and usually the wrapper that the other one came in, but sometimes just toilet tissue. My husband always tells me that it's really gross when he goes to the bathroom and can see the bloody tissue that my pad is wrapped in and he doesn't need to see that. We got in a fight about it with him telling me it's disgusting to see the blood and no one needs to know that I'm on my period, which I'm not on my period. I'm bleeding from birthing a baby. I told him that I would start disposing of my pads the way he wants me to when he learns how to wipe better and I don't have to scrub crap stains out of his boxes. He told me I was out of line and has slept in the guest room the last couple nights. Am I the asshole? Added to add, we have a trash can with a lid, but our dog recently broke it trying to get into the trash. I ordered another on Amazon, but it hasn't come yet and I don't have a car to go get one myself. OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the asshole. I feel like I'm the asshole because I got my feelings hurt and stooped down to his level and it felt incredibly immature of me. Now in the comments, you married someone who can't fully wipe. Maybe time to invest in a bidet, but if he's afraid of seeing period blood, I can't imagine how afraid his fragile mind would be at the thought of something touching his butthole. OP replies to that, I never did his laundry until recently when I had the baby and stayed home. Not the asshole. Stop doing his laundry. Tell him it's really gross to have to handle his underwear with poop stains on them and no one should have to deal with that but him. Problem solved. Not the asshole. You were dealing with a newborn, a house, other kids, Lokia, and this asshole thinks that your bloody pads are offensive. Homie, if you can't handle Lokia and bloody pads, you aren't ready to have the sex and make babies. He can F right off. I mean, hubby can't figure out the concept of wiping until the toilet paper is white, so it seems like OP is dealing with yet another child. I cannot fathom an adult man acting this way. His wife just experienced the trauma of childbirth, and he's stressing her out and complaining about items that have been discarded in the trash. If it bothers him so much, Don't look, toss some more tissues on top of it or take out the trash. For what it's worth, I managed to marry a guy who sang a jaunty, getting to know you, as he was wiping my butt after I had come home from being hospitalized. I had to wear diapers for a while, use a bedside commode, the whole nine yards. We had a potty party the day I could use our toilet with bidet on my own again. He does 100% of the laundry too. Mature men exist. Not the asshole, and stop scrubbing his underwear. He can wear the evidence of his inability to clean himself. Can we just pause and point out that crap is very easily water soluble and is absolutely no reason to have to scrub skid marks by hand. Just chuck it in the fricking wash. Our next post is titled, Am I the asshole? I got mad at my wife because she caused me to fail an important interview. I, 27 male, and my wife, 24 female, have been married for three years. She is six months pregnant. I have been looking for a job with a better pay since my wife said that she wanted to be a stay-at-home mom after the birth. Today I had this interview for a position at a very good IT company which would be paying triple my current salary. There were a lot of measures taken to prevent malpractice. I was not allowed to look anywhere but the screen, etc. The test was conducted on an online platform. I had told her numerous times before the exam about the strict invigilation. Just 15 minutes after the test started, my wife started knocking on my study door and calling out my name, saying that she wanted me to open a jar. I ignored her because I would be disqualified from the interview if I looked anywhere else or spoke. I figured she'd get the hint that I couldn't talk, but she didn't. She yelled at me, calling me an asshole, and went on to talk to her friends on call. It didn't stop at the calls. She played loud music for her online dance yoga class. It was extremely distracting, and I made a lot of mistakes in the exam. 
It was a multiple choice questions based test, so I got the results immediately, and as expected, I had miserably failed it. I was livid at my wife. This was the fifth interview that she ruined like this. I told her that I'd give up on trying to make her life easier, and that I'm not ready to go looking for any more jobs, since she doesn't even want to maintain silence during important interviews. I told her to start working again after the birth, and that I'm okay paying free nanny slash babysitter. She said that I'm being unreasonable in expecting perfect silence at home. Am I the asshole? OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the asshole. I believe I might be the asshole because I shouldn't have expected complete silence at home. Now in the comments, do yourself a favor, don't have any more kids with this woman. The less child support you have to pay when you split, the better off you'll be. Unfortunately, I think you are right. For that reason alone, OP should encourage his wife to go back to work. If she stays out of a job for a few years and they divorce, OP may have to pay alimony on top of child support. Honestly, it might be her plan all along. Sabotaging hubby until he wants a divorce so she can get alimony and child support and not work for the next few years? Not the asshole. You said that this is the fifth time she has done this. Well, her dream of being a stay-at-home mom is now gone. Let her know that she will be returning to work since she prevented you from getting a job that would have let her do so. Exactly. She is clearly doing this intentionally at this point, which makes no sense if her goal is for the family to be financially secure enough to stay at home with their child. Annex post is titled, Am I the asshole for shutting down access to my property and lakefront? Background. I recently purchased several acres of wooded property, a good portion of which juts out into a rather large lake. My little peninsula gives me some great lakefront, there's a smallish strip of beach, a dock and a few boat slips. Because of the woods surrounding the lake, I'm the only lot for several miles that has access to the water without going bushwhacking through the trees. Apparently, over the years, my neighbours have gotten used to taking their boats down my driveway to launch or going and spending time on the beach. I bought the place over the holidays and just recently moved in at the beginning of the summer, and before anyone introduced themselves to me, I was met with a regular stream of traffic cutting through my lot to the water. At first I thought it was because I purchased the property and didn't move in the right way that everyone just assumed the house and land was vacant and could take advantage until that was changed. So I started walking out when I saw people and letting them know that I lived there now and also making a point to make it obvious the house was lived in. Not much changed, so I got blunt and started asking people directly not to trespass on the property. I wish I could say my direct approach solved the problem, but people would still trek right through. I put up a fence and put up a sign stating private property, as well as a sign letting folks know that my dogs were on the property. Once I put the fence up, I started allowing them, the dogs, to roam the property and didn't want any trouble. Unfortunately, my neighbours took the fence and the dogs, despite the fact I owned the dogs well before moving to this lot, as an act of aggression. I had a neighbour come to my door and literally yell at me because my dogs barked at her kids when they tried to pull their rafts up onto my beach. That same neighbour advised me that my lot has always been the neighbourhood entrance to the lake. Apparently, a number of my neighbours built the fire pit and put tables and rocks and park-like features out there. In chatting with a couple of the friends I've managed to make in my new neighbourhood, they confirmed that what the neighbour said was true that my property has always been more of a park than a private lot. Anyway, while I feel bad that the convenience of nearby lake access has been cut off, I live by myself, and I'm personally not comfortable with anyone and everyone just traipsing through my yard. On one hand, I feel like it's absolutely my decision to restrict access to my lot, but on the other, I'm wondering if I'm breaking some sort of unspoken rule of access that was established before I ever got here. Am I the asshole for closing off my property? 
Edit to add, I'm not asking for legal advice, I have a lovely attorney, and I'm well within my rights to close down access to the property. There is no easement, and I own the shoreline. Edit to add two, the neighbors took me letting the dogs out on the property as a sign of aggression, they didn't literally take my dogs. As the dogs are a pair of Malinois, good luck taking them someplace they don't want to go. Edit to add three, the lake has two public parks, complete with boat launches and docks that are open for anyone's use, the nearest of which is a few miles down the road from my property. If a person were wanting to launch a boat, it would take about 15 minutes longer to do so by going to the public launch versus down my driveway. OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the asshole. I feel like I might be the asshole because there was a precedent set that anyone and everyone could access my property before I moved in. In fact, it seems like some of the neighbors even contributed to enhancing the property to be able to use it as a park-like area. Now in the comments, not the asshole. You can bet dollars to donuts that if someone gets hurt or drowns, they won't hesitate to sue you. OP replies, I'm sure you're right. You have to make your limits very clear and make them see that you mean business if you want to avoid problems. As someone with experience in property law and liability insurance, allow me to use the proper legal terminology. They will not hesitate to sue the absolute crap out of you. And even if they didn't want to, healthcare in the US means they'd probably have to in order to avoid crippling medical debt. Not the asshole. You own it and need to deal with it. I had to fight legally off trespasses also. I was nice only until it got me nowhere. And OP asks, what happened if you don't mind me asking? We sold this house seven years ago and lived there for about 10 years. It was in Northern Kentucky and we were their new neighbors. It was really only one neighbor, his kids and his friends. They were constantly hunting and four-wheeling on our 12 wooded acres. We asked them to stop over and over. When that didn't work, we had the sheriff ask them again, over and over. We got a fence and when that didn't work, we took them to court. The judge admitted he had the same exact issues with trespasses and he ended up ruling guilty, but asked if we would let him not administer the punishment. This meant if they even looked at us funny, we could call the judge and have him drop the hammer on them. We agreed and basically had the neighbor by the balls permanently. Not the asshole. Whatever was allowed before you bought the property means nothing when it changed hands. It is your property and you could be civilly liable if God forbid an accident happened. Post your property, put up cameras if possible. If the behavior persists, notify local law enforcement. Just because your property made access to the lake convenient for your neighbors, it doesn't give them the right to it. If the past owner wanted to grant these people permanent access, it should have been spelled out before you purchased the property. And now back to the post. Edit to add four, I'll post my more comprehensive plan as an update later, as a few people have requested. But this last update is going to give you guys a thank you for all of your comments and a quick insight as to what's rattling around in my brain after reading them. I still feel like my decision to shut down access through my yard and driveway is the correct way to do things. If there's a particular reason my lot should be used, I'll leave it open to one-on-one -on -one discussions. There is an intercom by the front gate now. I'm going to modify it to a video system that I can respond to from my phone, not just from within the house. As for the waterfront, there is no fence on the water, obviously, but there are signs alerting folks to the presence of the dogs. I really took to heart the comments about restricting access to the beach area, and I genuinely don't like the idea of doing that completely. So I'm working out a plan that will allow boaters to pull up and enjoy the waterfront without compromising my privacy, their or my dog's safety. I'm sure some type of landscaping could be devised to make it clear where it's okay to pull up and have lunch and where my expected privacy begins. Thanks again, guys. I'm very glad I was pointed in your direction. Even though I think the friend who suggested I post here may actually have been kidding. Laughing crying emoji. Am I the asshole for giving my sister-in-law baby formula? I'm going to start my post by saying that I don't have kids and I have no experience with babies or motherhood or children. 
I'm 18, and beyond being around them in group settings, where at least one of the parents and a ton of other people around, that's it. Just for some context to my post. My brother's wife had a baby 17 days ago. I didn't go visit them yet, but my brother and sister-in-law sent me some pictures. My brother said our cousin Rachel was around a lot because my sister-in-law is having trouble breastfeeding, and Rachel is a big believer in it and is helping her. I offered to help them if they needed it, and on Saturday, they asked me to go to the grocery store for them because no home delivery had an open spot. When I dropped the food off, I was shocked at how bad my sister-in-law looked. She literally looked like the walking dead, barely awake and not showered, and she was actually crying because she was so frustrated. It actually scared me how bad she looked. At first, I didn't want to butt in, but it bothered me so much, I went back to the store and got a can of baby formula. I figured it would give her a break and my niece could eat. It was even worse when I gave it to my sister-in-law because I said that it was no big deal if my niece got formula. It wasn't a problem. My sister-in-law broke down and I was honestly scared because she was weeping. Like in the movies when someone dies kind of weeping. No one told her that it was okay not to breastfeed. She felt so guilty because of Rachel butting in and no one telling her that formula was okay. I actually ripped my brother a new one because he sat back while my sister-in-law suffered. There was no way he didn't see how bad she looked. No offense, but she looked terrible. And I got my sister-in-law to shower after my niece ate and fell asleep and I changed the sheets on the bed and told my sister-in-law to sleep while my niece slept and I said that I would get more baby formula. I thought I did the right thing because my sister-in-law actually stopped crying, showered and slept, and the next three days she looked better and didn't cry again. My niece gets full. My idiot brother smartened up and told Rachel to stay away and everyone else, especially our parents and sister-in-law's parents to butt out. They take turns feeding so they can both sleep. My parents and Rachel are furious at me. Sister-in-law's sister was in agreement with Rachel and left me an angry voicemail full of swearing. Rachel basically had sister-in-law holding the baby while topless 24-7 and my idiot brother sat there and didn't help with the baby at all. Rachel breastfed all her kids until they could walk and talk and never had problems, but my sister-in-law obviously did. My dad said I overstepped and should not have butted in. Normally, I'm big on MYOB, but this time I was scared crapless after seeing sister-in-law on Saturday. Since I'm not a mother or baby expert, I have no idea what it's like with a newborn. I'm second guessing now after feeling like I did the right thing because everyone is angry with me and says that I should MYOB. Now in the comments, not the asshole. You probably saved the baby's life. Husband should have taken her to the hospital and they would have probably done the same thing, given the baby formula. Some people are so smug about thinking they are right, they ignore the facts under their noses. Edit, not only are you not the asshole, you are a smart, kind, and loving person. And OP replies, thank you for saying this. It sounds stupid, but I was second guessing myself because everyone got so mad. But honestly, I have never been more afraid when I saw my sister-in-law. Not the asshole. The breast is best crowd seem all too willing to allow suffering, but the reality is fed is best. And you did a good thing for your sister-in-law and the baby. Yes, fed is best. Also, just because it doesn't happen right away doesn't mean it won't happen. Just keep trying if it's important to you while you supplement. Baby's latch will get stronger as they get older. Breastfeeding is not linear. Proud of you, OP, for recognizing your sister-in-law needed help, not the asshole. Not the asshole. I teach developmental psychology, and one of the biggest conversations I have with my students each semester is that a fed baby with sane parents is the goal. Breastfeeding is often sold as the best and only responsible option, but that just isn't true. While breast milk is associated with better short-term outcomes, by the time the kids are in school, there is no significant difference between breastfed and formula kids. You did right by helping your sister-in-law. In that state, she couldn't be the best possible parent for her kid. Sometimes we need to be given permission to do things in a way that works for us rather than the way that society tells us. You gave her that permission. And OP replies, 
I didn't even realize what a big deal people made over breastfeeding until my sister-in-law broke down and I posted here. Before that, I had no idea. Sometimes it takes someone who doesn't know any better to say the obvious thing which everyone else is too afraid to say. It's like a superpower sometimes. You did a good thing. Our next post is titled, Am I the asshole for buying my son a Halloween costume? I, 34 female, and my husband, 35 male, have a five-year-old son together. My husband was raised in a family where boys play with cars and girls with dolls. Son has a huge obsession with unicorns and asked if he could go as a unicorn for Halloween. My husband told him no, and he would take him shopping for a boy costume. I found one in his size and wrapped the costume up to surprise him. I gave it to him after school, and he immediately went to put it on. My husband looks at me and tells me that I'm trying to change our son to be girly and should have bought him a Spider-Man or Superman costume. This incident happened over the weekend, and husband is still fuming over it. Am I the asshole for buying my son a Halloween costume? Now in the comments, everyone sucks here. This thread will turn into a debate about gender norms, but really, the situation is that you and your husband don't know how to discuss and resolve your differences in parenting. And if you think your spouse is irredeemable in his attitudes about all this, then buying a unicorn suit for your kid isn't fixing anything. Halloween won't be the only time of year where you and your husband disagree about how to raise your son. Start communicating and compromising, or expect a lot more turmoil. Not the asshole. Unicorns are unicorns. It doesn't matter the gender. It is a magic horse with a stabbing horn on its head. What is not to love? Not the asshole. Your husband is upset over a child's Halloween costume, because he is convinced it'll make your son quote-unquote gay. Your son is five years old. Nobody should be thinking that hard about the sexuality of a child. Your husband sounds insecure and homophobic. What will your husband do if your son does come out as gay years from now? Or, if your son is straight, will he forever be concerned about sharing his interests with his dad because he's scared dad will say they are gay interests? Not the asshole. Your husband should let him play with whatever makes him happy, not just what he deems manly enough. OP replies to that, My son loves My Little Pony. I bought him a few toys from the show and husband freaked out. Your husband needs to see a therapist to address his homophobia before it damages your child's development. Creative play, including fantasy themes, is good for kids, and potentially his relationship with your son. Not the asshole in the slightest. Info. What will happen if your son comes out as gay in a couple of years? Will he have a safe environment to do so? And what if he isn't gay, but simply keeps liking unicorns and the color pink? Is this a more common challenge in your marriage? And OP replies, My husband has made it clear that no child of his will be gay. I will support my son through everything. It's been a common challenge, and whenever I try to talk to him, he ignores my concerns. I am very worried about having another child with him. Not the asshole. I think perhaps you should have discussed it with your husband first, but overall, Buying your son a Halloween costume that he desperately wants does not an asshole make. Your husband needs to work on his preconceived notions regarding gender roles for the sake of your child. OP replies, I did discuss with husband about the costume, and it turned into an argument. Son wanted to be a unicorn, and husband told him that only girls like unicorns. Our next post is titled, Am I the asshole for doing a chargeback on my photographer after the session? So I was due with my second baby in December, but due to complications, I'm going to be induced this Monday. I had paternity photos scheduled for the end of November, and when I tried to reschedule, the photographer didn't have any availability. I was scrambling to find another photographer, and I found one, and I love her work. The only thing is, the first photographer I had booked had a studio, and I wanted a maternity boudoir session. This new photographer has gorgeous maternity boudoir in her portfolio, but it's outside, and it's just too cold for that right now. She agreed to try to rent space, but said it might be hard on such short notice. I paid her fee, $595, and agreed to pay for the studio rental fee as well. 
She did find one, but they have a two hour minimum. She felt bad sticking me with the whole cost, so she said she would go halfsies with me, which added an extra $120 to my total. She paid the whole fee of $240 and billed me my half. My session was supposed to be at 11.30 today, but my childcare for my older child fell through, so I figured I would just bring her with me and bribe her with candy to sit quietly. The photographer had been there since 10.30 because it was a two hour block, so I figured I would just go early, but when I got there at 11, the photographer was in the studio with another client. The studio I paid for. Then the owner of the studio told me that my older child was not allowed in the studio during boudoir sessions. You have to be 18 according to their policy, and asked if Mary, the photographer, had sent me the policy packet. I said no, and the owner didn't really care, just said older kid couldn't come in. I start getting upset at the owner, and Mary comes into the reception area, and I tell her, how could she not tell me you had to be over 18? Mary said she did email me the policies, but since I never mentioned having an older kid, let alone one that would be coming with me, she didn't see a reason to specify since I said that it would be just me. In the end, my mum came to watch older kid and Mary did my photos, but I was supposed to have an hour session and I only got 25 minutes because of the older kid. I saw the proofs and they're beautiful, but I'm still mad that one, I paid for the studio where Mary had another client who probably didn't have to pay for the space, two, my kid wasn't allowed and she caused me extra stress about it, and three, told me that she wouldn't photograph my newborn because of my behavior with the owner of the studio. I filed a chargeback for the full amount for the above reasons, and now Mary is suing me for the session cost and half of the studio. I don't know what to do, and she won't give me my photos. Mary has me blacklisted with the other photographers in the area now, and my mother says that it's no surprise after the way I acted, so I better get good at using a camera for my own photos. Am I the asshole? Now in the comments, Lamau? This is as clear cut a you're the asshole as they come. The studio rented out in two hour increments. You only paid for one hour. Therefore, your ownership of the studio only went from 11.30 to 12.30. One, you showed up early at 11 o'clock. That was not your studio time. Two, you freaked out about a reasonable policy. It's not your photographer's fault your childcare fell through. And three, you filed a chargeback for the full amount instead of trying to be reasonable and negotiating a partial refund, which I still don't think you would have deserved, frankly. You deserve to lose your court case. Also, it costs money to the vendor just because you filed a chargeback, as in the card network takes the money that you, in this case, rightfully paid, and an additional fee. Then there is an additional fee to the vendor to dispute it, this is insult upon insult on top of injury. You cost her money on the studio, her time and expense taking photos when she could have booked another person in your space who actually paid her, likely caused her issues with the studio owner slash other reputational harm, time and energy fighting you for the money she earned, and the freaking chargeback fees. I feel like when your own mother thinks you've crossed the line, you've usually crossed the line. Yeah. You're the asshole. In what world is bringing your child to a sexy photo shoot okay? And she provided you the services you paid for, so why file a chargeback? You're the asshole. Plus, her mum watched the child. Why wasn't the mum called as soon as she found out that her childcare fell through? I think the poster left some important information out because this isn't it. Shake my head. She was nowhere near the word count, so she could have included that information. And our next post is titled, Am I the asshole for telling my coworker that it's not my fault that she's single when she said that it's not okay for my husband to send me gifts at our workplace? My 26 female husband, 50 male, sends me gifts at work every day since we started dating. He usually sends me a rose and a coffee with a note wishing me a good day or just a note telling me that he loves me. Sometimes he also sends me chocolates or food from my favorite restaurant, etc. He's a very romantic and attentive man, and I love that. But my coworker, 40s female, doesn't like it at all. 
Yesterday, he sent me some croissants and a coffee with a note saying that he loved me. And when my coworker saw it, she said I should tell him to stop, that it's not appropriate to receive gifts every day. And another coworker told her that she was being bitter and that it's nice to have such a loving husband. That since I'm pregnant, it was understandable that he spoiled me so much. But she insisted that it's not appropriate in any way, and that if he doesn't stop, she will talk to our boss. She said that she will tell him that she feels uncomfortable and that I'm not being professional enough and that she wants another office mate. And that made me so mad because I'm professional enough. The things my husband sends me don't bother anyone and they're not a distraction to me either, but according to her, they are. So I told her that it's not my fault that she is single and does not receive anything from anyone and that maybe if she were not so bitter, someone would send her at least a coffee. And she got angry, and now she told everyone that I was rude, and that if I don't apologize, she will talk to HR to see what they can do with me. When I told her that I didn't think of being single as a bad thing, I only said it because she sounded like an envious person. That's all. But apparently, what I said hurt her. Am I the asshole? I think I should clarify that he does not show up to my work to deliver the gifts in person. He usually sends me breakfast because I can't have breakfast early in the morning. So when he goes to work, he stops by my favorite cafe and he orders what he knows that I like and tells them where the order should be delivered. The owners are his friends, so he gives them the notes to be delivered with the order. And last but not least, I received the order at the entrance. Nobody receives the orders for me. That's why I don't understand what bothers her so much. Also, it bothers her that I put photos of my children and my husband on my desk, which doesn't even make sense because those photos are on my side of the office. Sadly, this is not the first time that she says that I'm being unprofessional. As for her, having photos of your children in the office is not professional. So I don't know how I should act to please her. Now in the comments, everyone sucks here. So she may be jealous and should not have said anything since it doesn't affect her job. You replied with a personal attack, which puts you at the same level as her. As a random person, I just have to say that it's weird that your husband sends you a gift to your place of work every single day since you met each other. That is not romance, that's pissing on your property so everyone knows it's taken. Romance can be public at times, but the workplace is a weirdly public flex. That's what I thought about the everyday gifts, especially with the age difference too. I agree with you, everyone sucks here. I would honestly get really annoyed if my husband sent me gifts to work daily and would ask him to stop. Am I the only one who doesn't think ordering her breakfast is a gift? Nope, I'm here with you. He's making sure she's fed and feels loved. Plus, OP is pregnant, so he's also making sure his unborn child is cared for. Wow, he's a mastermind, red flag city. I think people really want to be mad about the age gap, but don't want to have to confront how unwoke that would actually make them, so they are latching on to him being kind? Thoughtful? That might actually be the real problem OP's co-worker is having with all of this. You're the asshole. Every day is excessively disruptive, and your comment was intentionally cruel. And before you start in on me, no, I'm not single. Daily gifts combined with the age gap gives a weird vibe. Kind of like her husband is insecure. Everyone sucks here. Sending stuff to work every day is honestly a bit try-hard and unprofessional. Why can't he get you flowers at home? Because then you wouldn't have a command audience for your grand romance. I would roll my eyes as your co-worker too. She should have ignored it. And when she said something, you could have been less snide about her single status. I worked with a woman whose husband sent jewelry and ginormous florals every major holiday. No one minded. She was pleasant and got her work done and wasn't smug. Am I the asshole for moving out against my parents' wishes? I, female 18, have several motives for moving out. One, I have issues with my dad. He fits the bill of a narcissist. He nitpicks minor details, controls all aspects of my life, friends, relationships, screen time. We have no privacy, as he constantly checks our phones and says extremely hurtful things. 
I've tried talking to him and my mum about it, but things never change. 2. Religion My parents are Christians and extremely conservative. They want their kids to live like them, but they tend to force us and manipulate us into acting according to their religion. 3. Homophobia I was outed to my parents as a lesbian by a friend years ago. They don't accept me. They say horrible things to me and put me through various programs to try to fix me. The beginning of this year, they found out I have a girlfriend. They flipped out. Even though I'm 18, they took my phone and kept me in the house for months. My clothing and haircuts are controlled. Everything I do is monitored and my siblings are recruited to spy on me. They are no longer providing financial support due to my sexuality, so I cannot attend university. I would be a lot happier if I moved out. I'm emotionally exhausted, and my mental health has seriously dipped multiple times. I've tried my best to comply with their wishes respectfully, but sometimes I've failed, by insisting on cutting my hair and by lying that I didn't have a girlfriend. Even though I haven't been allowed to see my girlfriend, we've managed to stay in contact. She has offered to let me move into her flat with her. It's on her parents' property, and they said they would support me financially until I'm on my feet. I was going to just tell my parents on the day I left, but I realized I'd be an asshole. So I told them. I explained that obviously we were having issues, and listed basic motives, and that it'll probably benefit everyone in the end. They were furious. They told me I'm being selfish and stupid, and that if I do this, I will be obliterating the bridge between us. They told me they saw no reason that I'd want to leave, and that I was being irrational. My father said I've broken my mother's heart and caused irreparable damage to the family. They told me I'm never going to be successful. They said they won't compromise on anything, but I shouldn't leave and they are apparently incredibly hurt that I'd want to leave at all, and said they think that I must have told a sob story that they are complete jerks and lied about them, which I told them I only told my girlfriend the straight, basic facts. They are using scare tactics and manipulation to try to get me to stay. I know that moving out in this way is more sudden, but I've done my best to be as prepared as possible, and my girlfriend's parents have been advising me. They think my parents are assholes and want me to leave as soon as possible for my own health. My parents' biggest issue is that they don't support me moving in with my girlfriend specifically. Am I the asshole? Now in the comments, not the asshole. Leave, get on your feet, never look back. Build the family that will love and support you for being you. Family and relatives are not the same thing. And read the book Harpy's Child. Google it to get a good sense of narcissists. Not the asshole. They just want to control you. Leave. Space will be better for you. And if having space doesn't improve their outlook, that means space is even more important for you. I agree, this is all about controlling OP. I'm glad there's good people out there supporting her getting out of that situation. Not the asshole. That line about it obliterating their relationship is such crap. Almost everyone moves out of their parents' house, and the majority maintain good relationships with their parents. The only reason this might be the case is if it was already a bad relationship, and the only reason it continues to exist is because you happen to live together. Is a relationship like that even worth anything? Not the asshole. You can't be an asshole for leaving your abusers. And if your parents were reasonable, non-abusive parents, they would never have reacted that way to you, an adult, deciding that moving out is what is best for you. By the way, just leaving them with no warning does not make you an asshole. It makes you a sensible person who escaped horrible abusers. And now on to the update. So it's been almost nine months since my last post. I left, I followed feedback, saying to not tell my parents exactly when I'm leaving, and I told them that I was still thinking it over. After an evening of my dad screaming at me about how I was replacing him, I arranged to leave the next morning while he was out of the house. I quickly packed all I owned. After being picked up, my dad called my girlfriend's mom, threatening to call the police. We went back to the house, and girlfriend's dad went in alone to talk to him. 
My dad even had a buddy come to defend him, but he lost the argument and I left. I have never looked back. I suffered from dissociation and flashbacks, but I'm really healing. I've been going to therapy, as my therapist is amazing. My dad is indeed a narcissist, and I had symptoms of PTSD. But I have made so much progress. I have low contact with him and strict boundaries. I'm the healthiest and happiest I've ever been. I'm working through things that were buried deep. My girlfriend's parents have taken me in and become the mum and dad that I've never had. I have never felt so loved. I have a real family and so much freedom. They are so accepting. Since leaving, I've gotten a pet gecko, came out as non-binary, and I'm currently planning me and my girlfriend's engagement with her parents. The ring is ordered. My girlfriend has been so supportive and she is the love of my life. She's currently sitting beside me and teared up reading my last post. I also reconnected with my grandparents and aunts in the US. They dislike my dad passionately, and I'm going to go there to attend college and follow my dreams. Immense thank you to everyone who commented on my post. It was a push that I needed, and I appreciate each one of you. My heart is full. Edit, thanks for all the support and comments. I feel bad that I can't respond to every single one of you, but I appreciate all of you. And I should have clarified, I really appreciate the advice that I shouldn't rush my relationship. I am very excited and we are getting engaged soon, but we are definitely only getting married when I'm finished in college and financially stable. I want to be fully prepared before taking that step. Now in the comments, as a mom of two LGBTQIA2S plus kiddos, I'm sorry about your parents. They are wrong. And I'm so happy that you are out of that environment. I only teared up a little because your original post made me want to punch my screen. Bit of an emotional roller coaster there. Lots of virtual hugs and high fives. And OP replies to that, Thank you for being a mum that I would have been so grateful to have. Your kids are blessed that their parent is a good human being who gives them all the love and acceptance that every kid needs. It's weird to be thanked, because I feel like that's how I should be as both a parent and a human, but I get ya. Just know, not all parents are like that, and just lots of hugs. Opie, I was in your very shoes about five months ago. I am insanely proud of you and rooting you on. My dad is a huge narc, and I have an enabling mother. I moved out in March, and I'm the happiest I've ever been. It is so, so freeing, and you don't realize the weight until you're gone and in the clear. And OP replies, absolutely. I'm so happy you found freedom too. Our next post is titled, Would I be the asshole if I refuse to sell my house below market value? I, 27 female, own a 75% share of a house with my ex, 28 male, who owns a 25% share. The difference is due to my own savings and inheritance money that I put into the house when we bought it a few years ago. Now we are splitting up, mostly because he and I want different things, and he is unwilling to compromise to meet my needs. The house is great, and in the city that we grew up in. He loves the place, and would like to stay as it has emotional value to him, but due to his lower income, he isn't able to buy me out at market value. He asked I sell him my share below value, which would cost me around 40k, so that he can stay. His reasons are because I don't love the city and the house, and will be able to get something equivalent. Also because I have ambitions to move abroad, so it's more pragmatic to buy him out than because I actually want the house. I also have more savings and a much higher income, so indeed it will be easy to get a similar place on my own, while that is impossible for him. While indeed it wouldn't impact me that much to lose the money, I just don't think it's fair, as he's been having much lower living costs due to our lower mortgage, due to the money that I put in, and I agreed to give him a share in the first place when I was planning to buy it alone, so he profits due to an increased market value if I buy him out. He thinks I'm an asshole for not agreeing immediately to his plan, and all our friends and family are on his side, and calling me a cold heartless cow for kicking him out after breaking up with him. 
So would I be the asshole to not agree to this plan? OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the asshole. I might be the asshole as I don't really care for either the house or the money and he is struggling big time to be able to get his own place if I don't agree to sell him my share of the house below market value. Now in the comments, not the asshole. If your friends and relatives want him to have that 40k, then they can all get together and give it to him. Not the asshole. Absolutely do not agree to his demand. It is not your responsibility to take a 40k loss just because what? That's what's most convenient for him? You've already put so much more into this house than he has. If there is a way to go forward with minimal or no contact with him, for example, having a lawyer handle all future communications, that would be best. Do not interact with any of the friends or family that he directed to attack you and block them if possible. Them calling you a cow is crossing the line. Reframe this one. Am I the asshole for not giving my ex $40,000? You are not the asshole. Not the asshole. OP's question about devaluing 40k over a 9 year relationship really goes to show how much others have pushed that idea into their head. The one and only reason that their ex has any ownership stake in the house is because OP was generous enough to allow them to buy a share when they wanted to purchase it alone to begin with. They were already taken advantage of once by their ex right here. The ex cannot afford that house, plain and simple. They couldn't afford it when it was first purchased, they cannot afford it now. The house should be sold to a third party at market value, and X can take their own share and buy a more appropriate home for themselves. If everyone else thinks they still deserve the house, they can give him or lend him the money to buy it at a reasonable rate from OP. And now onto the update. Thank you for everyone who commented at the time. Gotten a few requests for updates, so here goes. As per a comment, I told him I already gave him 9 years of my life and I don't owe him anymore. Strangely, he was calm and asked for 3 months to find a way to come up with the money. In the end, he bought my share. I am sure I could have gotten much more at the open market and our original agreement in hindsight was in his favour. But I do care for his happiness and decided to let it go. Like the house, most of the furniture was also mine, and he cried and pleaded for me to leave it behind, as he was broke and deeply in debt, with not only banks, but also friends and family. Like an idiot, I agreed, taking pity. I only took a few items, which I stored there while I found a new place. When I came to pick it up this weekend, lo and behold, he has gotten top end replacements for the items I did take, Broke? Hmm? My ass. All in all, he was just taking advantage of me and has zero dignity begging his ex for money, furniture, and it's clear to me he was always taking and never giving back. It was a very expensive lesson, and I probably was a wuss paying him off, putting my own financial stability at risk, as that is what happened, for someone who would have never done that for me even when we were together. Not the most exciting update, but I do get a fresh start in a place that is only mine. Now in the comments, you did something out of kindness and empathy. He took advantage. Don't beat yourself up for being a good person. Be glad you are away from this taker. Good luck in moving abroad. Yeah, mistakes were made, but nothing earth shattering. Cut your losses and move on, knowing that you are better off now that he is entirely out of your life. I'd rather live my life like her. His punishment is he has to live his life like him. Best in life, OP. I really like that way of thinking. I'm gonna remember that. It's how I think about charity or helping people on the street. Others tell me that I'm being naive and they'll just spend it on drugs or it's a con or whatever. Maybe. Possibly, probably, but that's on them. I'm doing a nice thing, trying to be helpful, trusting, and caring for people. That's how I want to live. If they are cheating me, that is how they live. If you are untrusting and suspect of everyone, yeah, you might be five bucks richer, but that's how you're living. I'm happy. Oh, he is still broke. 
probably bought everything on credit. Don't let appearances fool you. And if he did end up borrowing from friends and family in order to buy OP out, won't they be thrilled when he stuffs them? Stiffs them, I mean. Stuff them is good too. And OP, look at it this way. It cost you some money to walk away with certainty. For him to show his colors so decidedly, that purchased you some invaluable peace of mind. Best of luck for your future abroad. And OP replies, thank you. That might be the best way to look at it. Purchasing some peace of mind that despite his smooth talking, he's a selfish money grabber and good riddance with the whole man. Unexposed is titled, Am I the asshole for using my life expectancy in an argument? I, female 27, have a brother, male 30, who just got engaged and is planning his wedding. I have a lung condition for which there is no cure, and I make no secret of the fact that it'll end my life early. I recently found out that I'm not going to be able to have a transplant, and that it's unlikely that I'll be here for much more than a few years. So far, only my mum knows this. I told my brother that unless he was having the wedding somewhere that was wheelchair accessible, I wouldn't be able to attend, and unless it was held in or very near a hotel so that I could go and lay down if needed, I could only attend for an hour or so. My brother and his fiance decided on a venue that is both not accessible for wheelchairs and doesn't have any accommodation nearby. When I told my brother that unfortunately means that I'm not going to be able to attend, he told me that some of his friends could carry me up the stairs. I replied that I wasn't comfortable with being carried like a child and that there's no way that I'll be able to sit on a normal chair for the whole ceremony, as my wheelchair is adapted to my seating needs. My brother told me that I was just being difficult and that if I couldn't be bothered to accept a bit of discomfort to attend my own brother's wedding, then when I get married, he's not going to be bothered to come to mine. To which I replied that he doesn't need to worry about coming to my wedding because I'll be dead in a few years anyway. My mom has said that it was really unfair of me to use that in an argument and tell my brother that I'm only going to be around for a few years in that way. My brother won't talk to me. Am I the asshole? Now in the comments, not the asshole 100%. His bride probably had a vision of the perfect place and he didn't want to make waves. But that's not your problem and I don't blame you for not wanting strangers picking up your wheelchair. Unfair to blame the bride we know nothing about. He could be the one with visions as well and doesn't really see how serious OP's condition is if he is used to it. I don't think many people would tell disabled people they have to leave their wheelchair for one. Not the asshole. Also, I love that you throw that I'll be dead in a few years, not to manipulate someone, but just to end a meaningless argument. Boss move? And if I'm ever in a similar circumstances, I will be remembering this. However, I can see how this does come off as manipulative, not gonna lie. Well, not under the circumstances in question, however, since her brother was being an ableist, inconsiderate asshole. Not the asshole. He knew about any accommodations and chose a venue that you couldn't attend and then tried to make you feel bad for not being able to come. Now he's aware that you are not going to live for much longer and chose to shut you out of his life instead of wanting you to attend and spend the time you had left together. It is his wedding and he can choose the venue but he shouldn't force you to feel guilty about not coming. At the same time, there might have been a better time or way of saying your prognosis. I'm really sorry to hear about everything. And now back to the post, there is an update. Me and my brother have talked and we have both acknowledged that in saying, I won't attend your wedding, I'll be dead, we have each said things that are not kind. My brother and his fiance have apologized for being blind to my access requirements. They have spoken to the venue and they've decided to hold the ceremony in the garden rather than the reception room so that I can attend. The venue has some side doors that you can choose to put a big gazebo on to accommodate more guests. They weren't going to, but my dad has said that he'll pay for the gazebo so that I can be included in some of the reception and then get a taxi to the hotel when I'm tired. I'm glad that my brother and I have straightened things out and that I'm going to be able to see my brother get married. 
Am I the asshole for refusing to allow a friend to crash on my couch? I recently moved into a penthouse apartment. It's not all it's cracked up to be. It's called the penthouse, but it's just a two-bedroom apartment about twice the size the usual ones, located on the roof of my apartment building, and have been trying to put my life back together. Part of the problem, before moving into this place, is I was letting people practically walk all over me and get away with damn near everything, under the pretense of them being my roommates, i.e. they could do pretty much what they wanted as long as they paid their part of the rent, or so they said. I started going to therapy to help with some of the problems I was having, and part of that therapy was for me to move out. It was pure chance that I got where I am now and I couldn't be happier. However, one of the former roommates got kicked out of the apartment I left after he got a number of noise complaints, mostly due to his own anger issues and yelling at the top of his lungs that anyone on YouTube, TV, or news who annoyed him should be shot or something worse. Now, he doesn't specifically know where I live, just that I have more space than I did before. So he called me up and asked me if he could crash at my place until he could get an apartment of his own. I said no, and this was fine, until yesterday, when he started calling me and saying that since I live in a penthouse, that meant that I had space, so I needed to let him stay with me. I repeated my previous no, and he called me all manner of things before hanging up. Now, through our mutual friends, I'm being told that I'm being an asshole here, since I do have the space to spare, and it's unlikely there'd be a noise complaint since I don't have any neighbors per se. I just don't want to do something that may lead to the problems I left, but I can't help but kind of see some of their reasoning. Am I the asshole here, and what would be a better way to explain things to people giving me crap about it? OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the asshole. I may be the asshole because when the former roommate is on his medication, he's fine, and I do have the room to spare. I've just turned him down because I fear any possible future hassle that may come of it. Now in the comments, not the asshole. You moved out because he was a bad roommate. He got evicted because he is a bad tenant. Just because you don't have next door neighbors doesn't mean you don't have neighbors. You still have downstairs neighbors who won't be happy that some asshole in the upstairs apartment is shouting at YouTube videos all day. And even if you didn't have downstairs neighbors, you literally moved out because living with him was so terrible. Why would you want to live with him again? And OP replies, thank you, I really love it here. And for the first real time in years, it feels like everything is going in the right direction for once. Finally getting out of a bad living situation is a special thing. Don't let this guy ruin it for you. From the sounds of things, it seems like he has plenty of other people who care about his living situation, so I'm sure one of them will take him in. Think of it this way. If you let him crash for a day, you will be stuck with him forever, and getting rid of him will be a toll on your self-help progress. Don't ruin your happiness because of someone else's choices. Not the asshole. And any friend that calls you an asshole, you need to say, all right, so why don't you take him in? Don't bring him in because he will never leave. And he will cause problems for you because he doesn't take responsibility for his behavior, clearly. I'm not sure about where you live, but we would be kicked out if we let anyone move in who wasn't on the lease when we moved in. That alone is a good enough reason to say no. Regardless, you don't have to have a good reason. It's your home and you have no obligation to let anyone live with you for any reason. Anyone who tried to tell you otherwise isn't really a friend. And OP replies, I'm allowed to have a visitor for either a maximum of 90 days if it's not consecutive, i.e. spread out over the whole year, or 30 days if it is consecutive. However, I really just don't want to deal with him. I have had issues with this guy and his family in the past and posted here about it, and I'm reasonably certain that if I did let him stay here, he wouldn't look for an apartment or anything. And now on to the update. I took the advice presented by many in the comments and made it clear to the people calling me an asshole for not letting my former roommate crash on my couch that if they were so worried about him, then they should let him. One of the mutual friends stepped in and set some rules for him. 
specifically that it was only temporary and that he was going to need to make a serious effort into securing housing for himself. Part of that, as I understand it, was enrolling in a special program where he would attend regular treatment at a mental welfare group and would work with a caseworker about getting everything set up for him. The goal of the program being to provide a special voucher if the person were making an obvious and visible effort to fix the problems that had either caused them to be homeless or on the way to becoming it. He is refusing to go claiming that they don't really help anyone and that it's just a waste of time for him to bother going. I have blocked him on all social media outlets, but that hasn't stopped him trying to contact me. The friend who took him in has come to understand why I had to distance myself from that situation and he's already on very thin ice with them, due to his sheer laziness about everything. They try to get him help and he's refusing to do it. He's also refusing to leave their house now, and seems to be holding out his hope that I'll get lonely and ask for him to come join me. It's as if he honestly can't understand that I don't want anything to do with him. Having said that, I think they're going to give him a second chance with the caseworkers, but if he keeps refusing to go, I fully expect him to be kicked out on the street once more. I do know that everyone in our friend group have started to back away from him, having seen or heard what the other friend is dealing with, and maybe coming to realize why I reacted like I did to his being kicked out in the first place. As it stands, it looks like the only person that may be willing to take him in is going to be his mother, as even his older brother has washed his hands of the guy. I will update further if anything more develops out of this. Note, I have also instructed my landlord and property manager about the issue with this former friend slash roommate, and they have placed him on the do not enter list, meaning that if he sets foot on the property, they will refuse entry, and if he doesn't leave, they will trespass him from the property. It's a safety measure they usually take with domestic violence situations, married couples or otherwise, but feel that given my history, I fit the bill to qualify for such protection. And now in the comments, just one week with him on someone else's couch, and they all realize what an asshole the guy is. Good on you for not caving, OP. Hopefully you got a lot of apologies from some of those friends. And OP replies, most aren't talking to me anymore. I figure I can live without them. I'm only posting the update now as I have a meeting with my therapist in a couple hours and expect we'll bring this up. For the best, enjoy your asshole free apartment with no roommates or fair weather friends. And I hope there is at least one asshole in that apartment. How else will OP poop without one? Way to go for holding your ground and insisting on them respecting your boundaries. I bet you're so proud of yourself for maintaining a peaceful home. Keep up the good work. This is a great update. Keep doing what you're doing to remain safe. I'm glad he's on a do not enter list for your building, but do you carry some sort of mace or pepper spray? Not that I'm assuming your ex-roommate would come after you or anything, but with his anger issues, I would be taking every precaution I could. I'm also glad to hear some of your other friends are seeing the truth now. However, I would also hesitate letting any of them back into your life or your new apartment since it took another friend for them to see the truth. It seems like they didn't care about your opinion until someone else had the same one. Our next post is titled, Am I the asshole for telling my wife to stop being so jealous of my friend's fiance? My wife, 35 female, and I, 36 male, are good friends with another couple, my best friend Matt, 36 male, and his fiance, Rachel, 24 female. Rachel models and is very attractive. My wife is less conventionally attractive, but I fell in love with her for her humor and good spirit, which I personally find more attractive than good looks. Recently, I've noticed my wife making a lot of comments about Rachel, calling her an airhead, and just being kind of mean. When my wife makes these comments in private, I'm able to stand up for Rachel, but when they are made in public, I obviously don't want to embarrass my wife by calling her out. My wife and I went on a trip away with Matt and Rachel last week, which we had been planning for a while and really looking forward to. At dinner one night, my wife made a really mean comment after we started talking about the economy. She remarked, Oh, don't worry, Rachel. You can join in the conversation once the smart people are done. She was the only one who laughed. 
I was completely embarrassed, and once we were alone, I told my wife she had been really rude and I was ashamed of her. I told her she needs to stop making nasty comments, and she agreed. However, the next night we all went out to a bar. Rachel was getting a lot of attention from guys who were sending her over drinks. My wife was looking visibly annoyed that she wasn't receiving the same attention, so I tried to lift her spirits by paying for all her drinks and making a fuss over her. One guy came over and said that Rachel looked just like the model Zendaya. My wife let out a massive laugh and just said, Did you mean Whoopi Goldberg? I turned to my wife and straight up said, You really are so jealous, aren't you? She looked hurt but didn't have time to respond as Rachel had left the table in tears. I followed Matt and told Rachel directly that I was so sorry for my wife's words and that I was ashamed of her behavior. When I reunited with my wife, she told me I was horrible for calling her jealous in front of everyone and embarrassing her. I told her straight up that she was jealous of Rachel as Rachel is more attractive than her. I realize in hindsight this was a very heavy thing to say and can see why she would be hurt by it. However, I stand by the fact that it was said in anger. Am I the asshole? Edit. I forgot to mention that since the trip, Matt has messaged me to let me know that my wife is no longer welcome at their wedding and that as a couple, himself and Rachel have decided that they aren't interested in our friendship anymore if my wife is around. Rachel feels as if my wife has bullied her and has even suggested that some of the comments were racially motivated. I am so humiliated. And edit, just wanted to clarify my wife is stunning. I wouldn't have married her if I didn't think she was beautiful. She is just not as conventionally attractive. To me, she is the most beautiful woman on the planet, but objectively, Rachel is better looking. I am very open to being the asshole in this situation, but I definitely wouldn't want people to think that I'm not attracted to my wife. Your wife is acting real ugly on the inside, OP, that's for sure. That is some disgustingly ugly behavior by your wife. Now in the comments, not the asshole. Aside from the way that you handled it at the end, she is the asshole. Stop bringing her around when you hang out with Matt and Rachel. Don't lie to her though, just don't bring her anywhere they are going to be. If she doesn't like it, then oh well. She doesn't get to bully people and get rewarded. That won't be happening. The friendship is probably over. Not if OP apologizes directly to the both of them in person and promises not to bring the wife around again. It's over. Check out the first edit. Matt and Rachel uninvited OP's wife to their wedding and are interested only if the wife isn't around. If his wife is around, they are willing to be friends with OP, just not with his wife. Edit to add, I realize this may mean the end of the friendship till the end of the marriage, but I was just clarifying what OP said. But of course, you can be online friends for years until one or both of their relationships fail. OP's wife was so verbally ugly though that I don't know how he can think of her the same as he did. That's not how it winds up long term. They're willing to try to be friends with OP for now, but OP will have to 1. Never mention his wife. 2. Never mention big events in his life because his wife will be involved. And 3. It's going to cause a bigger divide with his wife, so he will have to handle that as well. These never turn out well long term. You can't stay married to someone's bully and long term keep the friendship even after the bullying ends. This doesn't even hit on the growing resentment because he's only just now told them that he doesn't agree with his wife and hasn't done anything to stop her in public before. If a friend doesn't stop your bully when they have the power to, are they your friend? That's what they're going to keep asking themselves the next few times they see him. Not the asshole, OP. The only person here who is not acting like a mature adult is your wife. You talked to her in private and she didn't listen. Unfortunately, sometimes people have to be called out in public in order for them to get the point. Jumping on here to add that the wife had no problem embarrassing Rachel in public, but got mad when hubby did the same to her. She has a lot of growing up to do. OP, not the asshole. Agreed. And the fact that people were comparing Rachel to Zendaya and OP's wife went straight to Whoopi Goldberg does imply that there might be some racial elements to OP's wife's bullying. 
Yes, a hundred percent. It's bad enough to feel inferior to someone, but if that someone is a black person, some people get extra nasty. And going straight to Whoopi, a woman who has been deemed hideous over the years just for being average looking, by Hollywood standards, with dark skin and locks, is very, very gross. Let's be honest though, Whoopi Goldberg has great skin and an incredible smile. Have you seen her in the 90s? Of course, now she's aged, she's not young anymore, but she was not even average. I feel she was actually pretty. And now back to the post, there is an update. Thanks for the feedback, guys. Just to add, although I didn't call out my wife in public, I regularly called her out in private after she would make comments. The reason we continued to hang out as a group is because the wife reassured me her and Rachel got on well and the comments were in good spirit. Matt would also continue to invite us out, so I didn't think it was too much of a problem. Also, in regards to the free drinks, Rachel accepted them for the table. We all shared the drinks and were joking around. The drinks were sent from the same two creepy guys, and it wasn't like the whole bar was buying Rachel drinks. Matt isn't insecure, and would rather accept the free alcohol. Also, my wife earns more than me, so we split costs 50-50 most of the time. I paid for her drinks this time to make her feel better. Before I update, I also want to make it clear that I don't have feelings for Rachel. I think she's a conventionally attractive girl, and she's a model. I'm not even really friends with Rachel, as some of you have pointed out, she's younger, so we don't have much in common. I also want to make it clear that my wife is conventionally attractive also, just less so than Rachel. Rachel is a model, my wife is not. This doesn't mean that I don't think my wife is more attractive than Rachel to me, I just mean objectively, Rachel is better looking. I agree with the comments that both my wife and I were the assholes in this situation. My wife's behavior is unacceptable, and mine was cruel, and have probably done lasting damage to my wife's self-esteem. I don't think I'm the asshole for failing to call out my wife sooner. In my opinion, you should never publicly criticize your partner, so for me telling her privately that the jokes were inappropriate is enough. I also want to point out my wife and I have already had couples counseling, and my wife individual therapy. When I initially made the comment that Rachel is more attractive than her, my wife was furious and rightfully so. She said that it was a cruel thing to say, and that she wasn't jealous of Rachel, and insisted that the jokes were not offensive and everyone was just tiptoeing round the pretty girl. When we returned home from the trip, and I received Matt's message, I let my wife know. At first she was hurt, but she eventually came around and said her behavior was inappropriate. She's admitted that she is jealous of Rachel due to her looks, and was embarrassed by her behavior. I also asked her if she felt as if I found Rachel more attractive than her, but she said she didn't think that. It was just difficult seeing a younger, prettier girl get treated way better than her, and she felt like second best. I think my wife noticed Rachel getting special treatment from other people, and was jealous that she didn't receive the same. My wife has sent an apology to Rachel, but I don't think the friendship is salvageable. I will still attend the wedding, but my wife won't be coming along, even if she is reinvited. I think it's worth my wife having some more therapy, and I'll have to rethink things. This has definitely made me see things in a different light, and I am really disappointed. Thanks again everyone for the feedback. Am I the asshole for refusing to talk to my mom until she apologized? Happened December 2018. Been thinking about the situation on and off since then. I'm 23 female, and my parents have me keep my phone's location on at all times, even though I'm a graduate student and live away from home. I was with my boyfriend, 23, for the day. My phone ended up at 5% before dinner, so I asked to charge it in his car. I knew that some cars can't charge phones if the engine isn't on, but boyfriend said that it'd work on his. I had also read online that putting your phone on airplane mode helps it charge faster. It turned off my location, which I didn't know about. I plugged my phone into the car charger, checked to see that it's working, then went into the restaurant. I even used my boyfriend's phone to text my mum and let her know that my phone was charging in the car and that she could text my boyfriend to contact me. I made it home by curfew and head to my room. 
A few minutes later, my mom immediately texts me and the following conversation happens. I don't remember the exact words, but here's the general gist. Mom, where were you? Me, what do you mean? Mom, your location was off. Me, I didn't realize I turned on airplane mode to charge my phone faster. Mom, you can't charge your phone when the car isn't on? Me, I thought that too, so I checked with my boyfriend and it works on his car. Mom, I'm going to try charging my iPad in the car without turning on the engine. Me, your car is a different model than his. It might not work. Mom, it doesn't work. I tried on all three cars. Me, like I said, his car is a different model. Mom, what car does he drive? Me, gives make and model of car. So why are you interrogating me? Mom, maybe if you used some better excuse. At this point, I felt hurt. I said that there was no reason for her to be questioning me like this, especially after I had already explained to her what had happened. I said it was really hurtful that she would accuse me of lying or making excuses when I went out of my way to keep her updated. She ignored what I said and even went on to say, next time he's here, I'm going to try charging my phone in his car when the engine is off to show that you are lying. I was really upset my mum didn't seem to trust me. I told her that until she was ready to apologize and treat me like an adult instead of a criminal, I didn't want to talk to her. The next morning when she tried talking to me, I ignored her. When my dad finally asked if we got into an argument, my mum said, I don't know what happened. She's mental. My frustration boiled over after hearing her dismiss my feelings in such a demeaning way. I ended up crying and tried to explain what had really happened to my dad. I barely got two sentences out when he cut me off and told me to apologize to my mom. When I refused, he said that I was ungrateful. Am I the asshole? Now in the comments, not the asshole. Forgetting everything else, you are well beyond the age where it's okay for your parents to feel entitled to your location 24 seven. Sounds like that is the least of her problems if she still allows them that amount of control of her life. I would agree, but I'm 22 and my mum can always see my location. It's not about control for us, it's about safety and also just convenience. I live in a big city away from her. She can make sure I get home okay. I can see where she is so not to call her at work or text her while she's driving, etc. But my mom is wonderful and totally not crazy, so she doesn't abuse that knowledge. This is blaming the OP for her mom's actions. Totally not the asshole, her parents are. This is 100% not about safety though. I can see how you do that and that's fine, but safety was what the daughter was doing. Letting the mum know what was up, somehow that wasn't good enough. So it's definitely not about the safety with the family at all. This is a control thing. Not the asshole. You are 23. Why are you allowing your parents to track your location? And who is imposing the curfew when you don't live at home? OP replies, I honestly don't really know why I allow it. Just that I've tried to turn off my location in the past and it turned into a big fight. So it's just less effort to accept the location tracking. And the answer to the second question would be no one. Maybe my antisocial tendencies. As long as it wouldn't make life more difficult for you, i.e. them cutting off any financial support they may be providing, I think it's time to have that fight. Sort of. Let them know that you won't be providing them with your location and when they try to argue or just ask why, let them know that that's your decision and the topic is closed. And now on to the update. So my mom never apologized, but I can't actually remember the last time my parents have verbally said the words, I'm sorry. Their way of apologizing is more, here's some food, now stop being mad at us. It's been two years since my original post and I'm not sure how much anyone really cares about an update, but here goes. Things with my parents continued to be rocky. When I wasn't staying at home for some reason, then things were okay. If I was, then some huge volatile argument would come up at least once a month. Some big moments were, one, 
was told something along the lines of, I freaking hope you catch COVID and die, then you'll realize how stupid you were for wanting to go back to your university town instead of staying at home with us, back when COVID first started. Two, repeatedly being told that I'm a useless waste of space who is not doing anything with my life after getting my master's and a full-time job as a therapist immediately out of grad school. And three, I suppose I was eating my food a bit too fast one night for my dad's liking and was called a disgusting pig. But you know, it's been two years, and if those are the only three-ish incidents that I remember, then that's likely less than 5% of traumatic memories. Give or take, I'm not that great at math. It doesn't matter anymore though, thanks to the aforementioned job. I'm finally in a place where I'm financially secure enough to live in an apartment with my boyfriend. It's been wonderful. We even adopted a crazy cat who loves smushing her face into ours. My job is amazing too, full of extremely supportive and understanding people. It's great working with an entire company of people who can respect mental health. I'm allowed to have an off day without feeling bad about myself or being shamed. I'm even in therapy now to work on my anxiety and depression, likely caused by my parents' not so supportive tendencies. It's been slow going, but I've been learning more about myself and learning how to be more forgiving of myself. I talk to my parents, but I'm not forced to talk to them. It is such a relief knowing that I'm not stuck in the same place as them that I don't have to put up with any emotional or verbal abuse without a way to leave. My relationship with my parents is probably better now than it was before since I'm not living under their roof. It's probably harder to be a disappointment from far away. <laughs> Just kidding, kind of. I don't hate my parents and I don't think I'd go completely no contact, but I have more control over how much of myself I give them now. Thanks everyone. Edit, to answer a question a lot of people seem to be having, location services have not been turned off. I had never been upset about having to share my location and honestly don't mind it. I don't really go anywhere out of the ordinary. In the original post, what had been most upsetting for me was basically having my mum imply that I was a liar and dismissing how I felt by saying I was mental. Just all the gaslighting that was going on. Besides, what are they going to do even if they can see my location? Ground me? Force me to go back to my apartment at a certain time? Yell at me over the phone? Drive three hours to tell me to go home? Like... I have a feeling that the original post was a bit confusing because I wasn't really clear. I was visiting my parents for the holidays, which was why I followed the curfew they had set. It wasn't like I was hours away and made myself go home at a certain time because my parents gave me a curfew. Other question, why don't you go completely no contact? Things with my parents aren't always that bad. Like I said, I was only really able to remember three really bad incidents, though one was kind of ongoing because I'd be called a waste of space on many separate occasions. And these incidents only happen when I have to live with them and be around them for an extended period of time. Things are generally fine when I don't have to live with them. I guess there's a part of me that is still holding on to hope that I can have a decent relationship with them. Last edit, I hope. I really, really appreciate everyone who expressed concerns about some of the things. I know that I still have a ways to go, but I made this post to share the progress that I've made so far. I'm in a much better place than I was before, and I'm happy now. For me, that is what is most important. Is there still more that I need to work on? Definitely. It will take many years of therapy for me to fully process my abuse, and I've barely started on that journey. I think maybe six months of therapy so far. All of you are wonderful, and thank you for all of your help. Now in the comments, good for you, and nice going finding such a supportive place to work. You say that it's great working with an entire company of people who respect mental health, I'm allowed to have an off day without feeling bad about myself. That is really unusual. That company sounds like a keeper. And OP replies, Thank you. I work with a bunch of mental health professionals, so it would make sense that they really value mental health for their employees. I'm glad you got out of such a toxic, controlling situation, OP. And OP replies, Thank you. The comments I got on the original post helped me a lot. 
I always knew the way they treated me wasn't completely right, I just didn't realize how wrong it actually was. Kind of that mentality of, well, it's been this way my whole life, so I'm just being silly. Reddit really helped me to open my eyes to the situation. Our next post is titled, Am I the asshole for not shaving my head to support my best friend? I, 24 female, have known my best friend Grace, 24 female, since we were 11 years old and I love her to bits. We have been each other's rocks throughout all our hard times, so obviously I was devastated for her when she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer a few weeks ago. Thankfully, her prognosis is optimistic, but she needs surgery and is about to begin chemo. I cried a lot when I first heard about her diagnosis, but Grace is one of those people who uses humor to cope in hard times, and she's been powering through it with her head held high. She is honestly my hero. We have a group of good mutual friends we've known since school, and yesterday, they invited me to a video call without Grace. One of our friends told us about an idea that she had that we should all shave our heads in support of Grace since she's going to lose her hair and make a video to put on Instagram and Facebook and the like. Everyone else looked a bit horrified when I firmly said that I wouldn't be doing that. I never had long hair my entire childhood as it's very thick and my mom didn't want to have to deal with it. And after having short hair as a teenager, I decided to grow it out. I haven't had a proper haircut since I was 17, and now it's almost long enough that I can sit on it. So I'm not keen to shave it off and start again. As someone who has lost close relatives to cancer, I also feel really uncomfortable with people who shave their heads in support, as to me, it just seems like performative activism to get attention on social media. My friends all went off at me about how I'm selfish and have no empathy for Grace and what she's going through, but... I don't think that you should have to put yourself through someone else's struggle in order to support them. I left the call and woke up this morning to a tidal wave of messages from other friends and family asking me why I was so nasty to my friends when they just wanted to help. I don't think it's made it through to Grace yet, as the head shaving thing is meant to be a surprise, and if it has, she hasn't talked to me about it. At this point, I'm questioning if I'm really being selfish and horrible because I adore Grace with all my heart, but I really don't want to lose my hair as well. OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the asshole. I'm beginning to think that my views are actually harmful, and I might be being an unsupportive friend by not doing this. Now in the comments, not the asshole. You're correct. Why do they need to blast this on social media, except for the look at how supportive we are being? You know what's supportive for your friend? Being there for her. Helping with appointments, sitting there while she's getting treatment, listening to her needs, wants, fears. What does shaving your head do? I think you should continue to be the best friend you can be, and if anyone gives you crap, tell them to F off and stop being attention seekers. Exactly. What they want to do is performative BS that doesn't actually help the friend at all. It's an attention grab for internet points while actually doing nothing for the person who is actually sick. OP, you have the exact right perspective. Keep doing what you are doing and support your friend as you planned. I also often worry that this would make the friend with cancer super uncomfortable. It's one thing to, maybe, lose your own hair and feel self-conscious. It's another to have a visible reminder of your diagnosis every time you look at one of your friend's heads. Not the asshole. Your friends are idiots. Even if we accept that them shaving their heads is supporting Grace, which is questionable, why do you have to support her in the same way as them? I'm sure Grace will need lots of things in the coming days. Someone to hang out, laugh, and cry with, someone to run errands, etc. Why are you not just as good a friend as these transparently Instagram clout-chasing knuckleheads? Right? I've given blood, O negative here, just because, for various causes, and even specific people. We had a co-worker whose young daughter was terribly sick with leukemia, so we all signed up to provide the family meals. There are other ways to be helpful and supportive without putting on a show for the world. Not the asshole. And now, on to the update. It has been way too long, but the dust has settled, so I'm finally able to give an update on the situation. 
Thank you for the awards and all the love and support for both me and Grace. I'm happy to say that she is doing very well and is still in great spirit nearly two months into chemo. I haven't been able to see her in person much, which is horrible, but we spend most of our days on FaceTime and I've been giving all the support I can. After my first post, I made what I think most would agree was the smartest decision and told Grace about our friend's plans. She actually laughed it off. She didn't think that they were serious and that they'd really do it. Unfortunately, I got an invitation to a Zoom call with Grace and the rest of the group not long after I made the post and immediately got an awful feeling. I really didn't want to, but I went because I wanted to be there to defend either Grace or myself, depending on what went down. As soon as I arrived, I was horrified to see that three of our friends had already shaved their heads and another was planning to do it in front of Grace during the call. Long story short, Grace was absolutely mortified. She absolutely decimated them about how they never should have done this without her permission or even telling her that it was going to happen. And instead of feeling supported, she now has a constant reminder of the fact that she has cancer. We both accused them of being self-centered and narcissistic people who didn't really care about her or her illness and only wanted to do it to A, post on social media and get attention, and B, have people ask why they did it and tell them what a good person and a good friend they are. I was trying to keep composed because it didn't feel like my fight to lead, but Grace did not hold back and used far more colorful language. As I said in my last post, she is my absolute hero. Needless to say, neither of us are in contact with those four people anymore. Though we are civil with the others from the initial call about the head shaving who didn't actually go through with it. Both Grace and I are very happy that I decided to tell her beforehand so it wasn't as much of a shock when it happened. And she's glad that she doesn't have to endure what would likely have been a lot of mock support from our ex-friends throughout her cancer journey. And for some extra satisfaction for everyone who was as mad about the situation as I was, although Grace says that it has thinned, as of right now, she hasn't lost any hair. Now in the comments, lol, my aunt did this when my dad got cancer, and all it did was broadcast to everyone how little she actually cared. His chemo drugs wouldn't cause hair loss, and he was so excited about it that it was the first thing he'd tell anyone who visited or called him for two months leading up to the chemo starting. I'm sorry, but I have to laugh that Grace didn't actually lose any hair, so these people just made themselves bold for no reason. Especially as they can't claim it's to support Grace, because Grace wants nothing to do with them. Actual clownery. Grace is my hero too. She sounds awesome, and I'm glad she has a friend like you in her corner while she's going through this, and she sounds like an awesome friend to have. I hope everything goes well with her. The audacity of those people. I'm glad you and Grace are no longer in contact with them. Best wishes and healing light to Grace. Am I the asshole for not wanting my disabled sister at my wedding? So my 22 female sister Anna, 21, is special need. She has severe autism and while she is verbal, most of her communication is physical, like sign language due to her social discomfort. She does speak around family though, and has pretty bad cognitive skills. She can't comprehend boundaries and lives with our parents so they can best watch her. I am getting married in three months. We planned a simple wedding and reception at my fiance Michael's parents' barn and farm. Since it's all gonna be DIY and we aren't planning anything too expensive, we can do things pretty quickly since flowers, food, and decor will be provided by his family. I sent out invites last week, and I asked that Anna not come. I told my parents I understood that would mean that they may not show up, but it was just a heads up. Why no Anna? She has an issue with touching Michael and trying to kiss him. At times when we were at my parents' house, Anna would try and grab Michael's hands, try to lean in to kiss him, or would have really bad shutdowns if she wasn't allowed to be directly next to him. We've tried speaking to her, but there's only so much we can do when she doesn't really understand. I told my parents I just want one day for Michael to be my partner and not Anna's comfort person. They called me selfish and asked how I expected them to agree to something like this. 
They told me that Anna is disabled and may never experience a wedding of her own, and while I have Michael for probably the rest of our lives, she'll have no one, and that Michael and I can be a little bit more understanding of the reality of her life. I feel like a total ass, and what they are saying has really gotten to me, and I'm starting to question my decision. Am I the asshole? Now in the comments, not the asshole. I don't care if I get downvoted, you're right. She is incapable of leaving your fiance alone on the only day she needs to leave him alone. Best wishes to you and your future husband. And edit to add, since this blew up, let me clarify. She needs to leave him alone every day. And that is solely the responsibility of the parents to teach those boundaries, not OP or fiance. Not the asshole. Would have been no assholes here, right up until the parents started to argue that Anna will never get to experience a wedding of her own. That does not mean Opie and Michael should have to give her theirs. They have both been great with Anna's behavior in the past, but like Opie says, when it becomes too much, they have to leave to get her to stop. This is not something they can do at their wedding. It sucks, it's horrible for everyone involved, Unfortunately, there is no possible way for Anna to attend where the wedding is not ruined. Neither one will get to experience a wedding of their own if Anna comes and cannot be away from the groom. Never mind the fact that plenty of people never experience getting married. It's not like it's unheard of. Not the asshole. Your partner deserves not to be sexually harassed every day, but especially on his wedding day. It doesn't matter if she doesn't understand. She still can't do it. If your family won't prevent her from doing things, then she isn't allowed in those situations. Yeah, no one's talking about this. Seems like harassment, and I wonder what Michael thinks about the whole situation. It's his wedding day too. Once it becomes physical, touching slash trying to kiss, it becomes sexual assault. Not the asshole. Neither is poor Anna. It's your parents. They told on themselves because it sounds like they expect you to share your spouse with her to make her life more fair somehow. It really, really sounds like they've been secretly encouraging and supporting this behavior. The most charitable thing that I can come up with is maybe they have deluded themselves into thinking anything to avoid a meltdown. But that way lies madness. And now onto the update. My parents called, letting me know that they won't be coming, and that it's best I don't bring Michael around anymore, since I've chosen some man over my sister. They told me that Anna wanting to kiss Michael and hug him is normal for a woman her age, and that she doesn't understand what her feelings mean. I suggested they try to redirect her during the wedding, but they said Michael is going to be family to her, and he needs to get over it. I suggested they watch the wedding via web, and they said that it's not fair and that they deserve to see things in person. I then asked if I could pay for someone with proper credentials to watch her that day while they pay attention, and they asked what I would do when they died and if I'd pawn her off every time. I dropped the unfortunate truth bomb that I don't want to put any more of my life aside for Anna anymore. I did it up until I turned 18, and that Anna is not my life's responsibility, and I won't be her keeper. I assured them that I'd pay for her care, but if she's okay doing this to Michael, then I worry for if I ever do choose to have children, and that she'd do that to them. They said I was sick for suggesting she'd do anything to my future children, and hung up on me. They sent a lengthy text telling me not to contact them until I could do the right thing. So that's where we are right now. Our next post is titled, Am I the asshole for lying to my parents about my sister's love life? My parents are rich and conservative. My sister and her long-term boyfriend were dating for a long time, but they were resistant to getting married. My parents really wanted her to get married as quickly as possible. They offered them a down payment for a house as a wedding gift. It was a lot of money, and I think they needed it. They agreed and got married about three years ago. They moved to the city I was staying in and bought a nice house. The weird thing was that their roommate from before also moved with them and they let a room in their house to her too. I don't know the exact details about their relationship, but from what I can see, it's obvious that all three of them are involved. They have one photo of the wedding and the rest is of all three of them together. 
It was none of my business, but my sister and her husband seemed happy, and well, it's none of my business anyway. Well, my mum found out about this somehow. She is furious at my sister. She thinks she is sinning, and she has patricianly disowned my sister. She is also angry with me, as she knows I am close to my sister and visited her often. They had their suspicions for a long time, and she'd asked me vaguely about it before. I don't know how or why my mother was suspicious, but yeah, I lied and pretended that they didn't have the roommate. My mother feels like my sister ripped them off and lied to them, as she feels her marriage was a sham. She is angry with me for abetting my sister and lying to her. It was a ton of money, even for them, so I understand some of their anger, but I have mostly been able to stay civil with my parents. I hate lying, and I actively lied to them about it. I feel like they are in the wrong here, but none of us come off looking good. I also feel like technically they paid her to get married, and she did. But that's the kind of argument my dad would use, so I know I'm an asshole here. Now in the comments, not the asshole for multiple reasons. One, it's not your news to tell, it's your sister's. Two, you didn't even know what the actual situation was, and if you didn't feel like it was your business to ask, that is understandable. Three, you didn't lie to them. You chose not to spread your sister's business. That's different, and I'd say you were the asshole if you told them behind your sister's back. Four, four, your parents were going to find out eventually, whether that was by accident or by your sister telling them. Knowing they'll find out eventually, I wouldn't have told them either. And five, you didn't even know about the third at the time of the wedding, so any argument they use about wasting their money on the wedding is null. Not the asshole. There is definitely some room for debate in the ethics of them accepting money from your parents for getting married, knowing they were deceiving them about the true nature of their relationship, and also of your parents essentially trying to bribe them to get married, However, those issues are both irrelevant to this question. It was not your job or your place to tell your parents about your sister's situation. And not the asshole. In my opinion, what two adults, and three in this case, choose to do with their life ain't no one's business, not even the parents. So long as it ain't hurting no one, it is their happiness. In your case, it's a case of don't ask, don't tell. She got married like the parents wanted, end of. It's not your secret to tell. Again, she wasn't hurting anyone, and if she was doing something illegal, that's different. Once more, put your mind at ease as you were not in the wrong. And now onto the update. All the not the arsehole comments helped me soothe my mind about the guilt I felt about lying to my parents. My mother said that both of us were not invited to Thanksgiving anymore. Okay. I finally got the opportunity to talk to my sister yesterday. All three of them were in a relationship. I told her that I was cool with it and that I had known for a long time. I asked her about the money and she told me that dad and mum had ambushed them during a dinner and then asked them to decide before the dinner was finished. Pretty screwed up, but typical from dad. I think they thought my sister and her boyfriend would stop sinning if they got married. My sister still sounds bitter about it. They are planning to hold a very small marriage with all three of them and forget about the shitty wedding that my parents had paid them to have. They are planning to do it next year when they hit the 10th anniversary of their relationship. My parents are probably going to cut them off too, but at this point, I really don't need their money and that is the only thing of value they can offer. I am just happy for my sister and her partners. Now in the comments, it sounds like you're a good sister if your parents are going to cut you off for supporting your sister. And OP replies, meh, they're not very good people. Sounds like the perfect opportunity to start some new Thanksgiving traditions with your sister and her partners. OP replies, I usually spend Thanksgiving with my boyfriend's family. I love it, but this could be a nice change of pace. It's weird that your parents forced your sister to get married, but not you and your boyfriend. Were they concerned about you sinning as well? And OP replies, Yeah, they've tried to convince me, but they know that pushing too hard doesn't work as well with me. Congrats to your sister on finding a relationship that makes her happy. Ten years is a long time, and that the three of them got through that wedding? 
which must have been really hard for all three, but I especially feel for the one not in the wedding, and stuff is a testament to their bond. You sound like an amazing sibling, and I'm sorry about your parents. And OP says, yeah, they really didn't look happy during the wedding. They look stressed out, and I remember wondering if the wedding was going to blow up. Now I see why they were upset. My parents are just horrible. They knew she needed the money badly and used it as leverage. Our next post is titled, Am I the asshole for making a huge deal about my stepmom's birthday while not doing much for my bio mom's birthday? So my 17 female bio mom is pretty in and out of my life. She's more present in my life now, but yeah, like till I was like 13, she pretty much showed up once a year. It was just my dad and me for a long time until my stepmom showed up. She is amazing. I have a younger brother now too. I get to spend a lot of time with my dad and she's really cool and she tutors me. Like, yeah, I really like her. So the thing is that both of their birthdays are on the same week, but I kind of forgot about my bio mums. I clearly remembered my stepmums as she was turning 40. I bought her a gift and made breakfast for her and I posted a ton of pics of us on my story and feed on Insta. I remembered my mum's birthday a day before. I didn't get her a gift or anything, I just wished her a happy birthday and that is about it. Anyway, this was about a week ago. I was visiting my mum and grandparents and they stay together. Mum didn't say anything but grandma did say that I let down my mum by doing nothing for her birthday. She told me mum was excited for her birthday after seeing all that I did for stepmom, and she was pretty crushed about it. Mum was not there when grandma told me this, but yeah, I could feel a small difference in the way that she acted with me. I have been thinking about this. I feel like I really hurt her here. Like if my stepmom went all out for my brother's birthday, and she just did the bare minimum for mine, I would be crushed. I mean, I did feel a bit lazy and just not up to it. I don't know why, but I didn't really want to wish mum for her birthday, and it didn't make me happy, but I guess I should have done more. I could have done more, but I guess I was just lazy. Now in the comments, quote, grandma did say that I let my mum down by doing nothing for her birthday. You showed her exactly as much love and attention that she showed you for 13 years of your life, not the asshole. Mum isn't an asshole though either. I mean, she was for disappearing, but we can't write her off yet, as it appears as of late she's been trying to fix her mistakes. Even when she was upset, she kept it to herself. Can't blame mum for being upset, and she handled it perfectly. She kept it to herself, and Opie didn't even know she was upset at the time. It was grandma who screwed it up, and is the shitty one here. You're right, we can't write her off, but she also doesn't magically become on the same level as stepmom just because she decided to be there four years ago, at a point where OP was already pretty independent. Not the asshole. And good on Bio Mom for not really expressing her disappointment to you. So points there. I even give kudos to grandma for letting you know, as long as she wasn't nasty about it. Bio just needs to realize there is still lots of repair work to do on your relationship and it may never be fully mended. Considering she didn't lash out at you, I think she does realize this. She's probably sad but knows it's a situation that she created herself. I really don't think you are lazy, you just don't have as close a relationship to Bio Mom and that's okay. And now on to the update. Almost all the commenters said that I was in the right here. I still felt a bit guilty. I decided to talk to my bio mom about this and yeah, had a nice conversation. She said I didn't do anything wrong. She was feeling bad about herself and her own decisions, which made her miss out on me and she was really grateful that I had a great stepmom who loved me. She also said she knew she had a lot to make up for and it would take years for us to have a trusting relationship. She told me to ignore grandma about this as she was just being protective about her, but that she had her life firmly under control and she hoped she could spend more time with me and make up for all the time that she had not shown up for me. It made me cry. I like my bio mom. She is a nice person and she's fun to hang out with, but I don't really trust her. I think I'm starting to trust her a bit more now, 
I just think that grandma was just sensitive. I may make more of an effort next year. I don't know. We will see. And now in the comments, talking to Bio Mom was 10,000% the right move here. I'm glad you did that and it went well. It sounds like Bio Mom wasn't ready to be a mom when you were a kid, but at least she's trying now. I hope she stays true to her word and puts in the work to build up trust. And I'm glad that you also got a great stepmom. I'm sure it's a relief to her that her stepdaughter is loving towards her and a good big sister. Not every step relationship goes that well. Thank you for sharing this update. It sounds like your bio mom is doing well and really trying to grow and mature. It's wonderful that you were able to communicate with her. As someone with an absent father, I'm honestly jealous that your mom admitted to being wrong. It doesn't mean that you should completely trust her, but it's okay to acknowledge that she's messed up and she wants to try harder. Good job on communicating.